Members, the next order, the next item on the order paper is a legislative consent motion for the coronavirus bill. I will ask the clerk now to read the motion. That the motion relating to the legislative consent motion for the coronavirus bill as detailed on the order paper be agreed. Thank you. And I call on the Minister of Health to move a motion and to also address his amendment. I beg to move. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. Uh, please open the debate, Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll let members get good time maybe to sit down. Mr. Speaker, um, we are living in unprecedented and challenging times, and I think we will require unprecedented and challenging actions in the days ahead. Coronavirus is without doubt the most serious public health emergency that has faced the world in over a century. People have sadly passed away in Northern Ireland, and we must prepare ourselves, for there will be more. Never before has our National Health Service faced such a looming and fear-provoking crisis. The virus is here, and it will get worse before it gets better. But the actions that we take today, tomorrow, and the days ahead will hugely impact on how many lives will be lost. So as we discuss the objectives of this bill, I would urge members to keep that to the absolute fore of their thinking. I want to also take this opportunity to provide members with an important update on the latest state of play um, in relation to testing. We are currently scaling up testing capacity across our health and social care system. And I am pleased to say that as a result of the actions of staff, the scale, the scale up is progressing at a rapid pace. The most recent update which I received yesterday is that we are now doing, doing over 600 tests per day in the regional virus reference laboratory. This laboratory will be doing 900 tests per day by early next week. Two other trusts will commence testing this week, which will add another 250 tests per day. So that will bring our testing capability to over 1,100 tests per day. I want to say a sincere thanks to all our staff involved in the work to scale up this capacity across our health and social care system. So given the current contacts, the laboratory testing is reserved for a number of priority groups. These are people admitted to hospital, key healthcare workers, and in circumstances relating to the management of outbreak clusters. Key healthcare workers include staff working in emergency departments, critical care units, primary care, and in frontline ambulance staff. These priority groups for testing have been determined following discussion with national experts, scientific and advisory groups. The priority groups for testing are under constant review and are likely to be expanded further as our testing capacity increases. I have established an expert working group to take forward work testing scale-up. We are fully plugged into the national discussions relating to work to scale-up testing for healthcare workers, and I will be able to share more information on this in due course. Mr. Speaker, moving to the issue at hand, you will be aware that it was necessary for me to table an amendment to the motion in order to deal with some recent amendments to the bill which relate to matters which are devolved to Northern Ireland. And it was important to have these clauses reflected in this motion. Whilst I appreciate that this is not an ideal situation, we are operating in unparalleled times, and the coronavirus bill is moving through its various legislative stages at pace. Members will be aware from my previous statements to the Assembly that my department, including the health and social care system, has been planning extensively over the years for an event such as an outbreak of a pandemic. This is to ensure that we are well prepared to respond in a way that offers substantial protection to the public, as has always been the case. My priority as Minister of Health is to ensure that all effective measures continue to be put in place in Northern Ireland. But I would stress that for social distancing measures announced yesterday to work, everyone in Northern Ireland needs to understand clearly that the vast majority of 
commercial premises must close. Only those providing essential goods and services can stay open. All others must close and close now. Let me be crystal clear about what that means. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, this is not merely guidance or advice. It's an instruction. If it's not heeded, our hospitals will be overrun and many people will die needlessly. If it's not heeded, then we will not hesitate to enforce it with penalties that include an unlimited fine. It is as stark as that. As part of that work, my department and the devolved administrations in Scotland and Wales have contributed to the UK-wide Coronavirus Action Plan, which was published by the UK Government on 3 March. The Action Plan highlights the procedures which need to be put in place to delay and mitigate the threat posed by COVID-19. Among the suite of measures identified in the Action Plan is the introduction of a coronavirus bill. This will ensure that the UK has robust, proportionate and effective legislative measures to deal with the impacts of a widespread COVID-19 outbreak. The coronavirus bill was introduced at Westminster on the 19th of March and contains emergency provisions that we need to have at our disposal to deploy only if required. And I want to stress only if required are key words. In situations like this, it is normal and indeed good practice to plan for a reasonable worst case scenario. However, I do want to stress that by preparing for such possibilities, it doesn't mean that we anticipate to expect those results to arise. But if we don't take the actions that we have been instructed to take, they will. From a Northern Ireland perspective, the coronavirus bill is being used to provide relevant Northern Ireland departments with the necessary and proportionate legislative powers to allow them to act in a rapid and effective way to deal with the severe pandemic. Mr Speaker, the bill is regarded as a priority across relevant Northern Ireland departments and ministerial colleagues from a number of departments have provided provisions pertaining to their own remit. Each minister supports me as the Minister of Health in taking forward these provisions on their behalf. In broad terms, the main purpose of the coronavirus bill is to increase the available health and social care workforce by allowing recently retired health and social care staff to come back to work in order to support the efforts to tackle this outbreak. To ease the burden on frontline staff by reducing the number of administrative tasks they have to perform and allowing key workers to perform more tasks remotely and with less paperwork. To contain and slow the virus by reducing unnecessary social contacts for example, through banning certain mass gatherings and controlling school and childcare closures, and to manage the deceased with respect and dignity, by enabling the death management system to deal with increased demand for its services, and to support people by allowing them to claim statutory sick pay from day one, as well as helping the food industry to maintain supplies. As I have already indicated, the provisions within the Bill cover a broad range of topics that relate to various Northern Ireland departments. For example, the Bill contains measures to help contain and slow the spread of this virus. Provisions in Clause 35 and Part 3 of Schedule 15 to the Bill will enable the Department of Education to give directions requiring the temporary closure of schools, the Department for the Economy to give directions requiring the closure of further and higher education institutions, and the Department of Health to give directions requiring the closure of childcare provision. However, I stress that there is a requirement for the respective departments to have regard to the advice from the Chief Medical Officer before issuing those directions. Clause 36 and Part 3 of Schedule 16 provides for temporary con continuity directions which will allow the relevant departments to issue temporary continuity direction which would require schools, further and higher education institutions and childcare providers to stay open. Again, the respective departments will be required to have regard to advice from the Chief Medical Officer before issuing such directions. The Bill includes powers relating to police and injustice, justice functions, which are intended to alleviate the administrative burdens related to the justice functions in the event that widespread absences Related to the spread of COVID-19, 
actually happen and will happen. They are to reduce the capacity to deliver those functions. Um, for example, Part 1 of Schedule 26 provides powers for courts and tribunals in Northern Ireland to direct and use live links in respect of participation in any court or tribunal proceedings, where the court determines this to be in the interest of justice. Live links can refer to either live audio links or live video links. Another key feature of the Bill is the inclusion of provisions to ease a number of existing legislative and regulatory requirements. Emergency volunteering leave is a new form of unpaid statutory leave. Its purpose is to maximise the pool of volunteers that can be drawn upon during a specific 16-week emergency volunteering period. The volunteers will fill capacity gaps within the health and social care sector and will help to safeguard essential services that are at risk as a result of pressures caused by the pandemic. Schedule 6 of the Bill enables the Department of Health and the Health and Social Care Board and any of the Health and Social Care Trusts to identify and certify volunteers by means of an emergency volunteering certificate. Schedule 6 also addresses the two primary deterrents to participation in volunteering. The first is the risk to employment and employment rights, and the second is the loss of income. This provision provides protection for employment and employment rights during, following, or when seeking a period of emergency volunteering through the modification of the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996. In the event of a severe outbreak of COVID-19, the number of people off work is likely to increase significantly. This would include those who are displaying virus-like symptoms, as well as those who are self-isolating as a precautionary measure in accordance with public health advice. In a potentially reasonable worst-case scenario, it has been estimated that up to one-fifth of employees may be absent from work during the peak weeks. This would clearly present a significant financial burden on employers through increased statutory sick pay costs, so the legislative changes proposed are therefore intended to provide the ability to provide relief to employers, with the current focus primarily being on the small to medium enterprises. The Bill also provides the power for regulations to be made regarding the recovery from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs of additional payments of statutory sick pay by certain employers for absence related to coronavirus. The ability to recover statutory sick pay is important so that employee, employers are supposed, supported in a period when their payment of statutory sick pay are likely to escalate. It is also necessary to ensure that employees are incentivised not to attend work when advised not to do so for reasons of health security. Ordinary statutory sick pay is not payable for the first three days of sickness, which are commonly referred to as waiting days. There is provision in the Bill to allow regulations to be made, which will temporarily suspend waiting days for those employees who are absent from work due to coronavirus. This is only in the event and for the duration of a severe outbreak. Clause 45 of the Bill also makes provision to adjust the pension scheme regulations for retired health and social care staff, which would enable them to return to work for short periods without the loss of pension entitlement. The purpose of provisions at Clause 17 and 20 and Part 3 of Schedule 12 is to relax requirements in relation to certifying deaths and cremations. As members will be aware, there are normally very strict requirements around certifying deaths. These clauses contain some relaxation of some of those requirements in order to cope with expected higher than usual number of deaths and fewer doctors. The principal purpose of these provisions is to enable death registrations to be processed more expeditiously at a time when, regrettably, there may be an additional burden as a result of an excessive number of deaths. In normal circumstances, if an inquest is held in relation to a death in custody, that needs to be held in front of a jury. Clause 29 makes provision to suspend the requirement in Northern Ireland for an inquest to be held with a jury in relation to a death from COVID-19. Clause 30 of the Bill will also enable a coroner to hold or continue to hold an inquest into a death in the prison from natural illnesses without a jury.
Mental health legislation exists to provide for the compulsory detention and treatment of patients and mental capacity legislation to ensure that those who are unable to make decisions for themselves are protected against arbitrary decisions. Our laws ensure that these powers are only used when a person is so unwell as to need them and when he or she presents a serious risk to him or herself or others. The law strikes a balance between safely caring for people and protecting their rights. The temporary modifications of the Mental Health Order and Mental Capacity Act at Schedules 9 and 10, respectively, have been, have been deployed with the interests of the person in mind. We must do all we can to ensure the continued and safe running of mental health services and the deprivation of liberty safeguards, and to allow certain flexibilities to be introduced at the point at which they may be required. Mr Speaker, another key aspect of the coronavirus bill is having measures which will help to enhance the capacity and the flexibility deployment of staff across essential services. In that respect, the bill makes provision to allow for the registers for various professions such as nurses, other health professionals and pharmacists to allow temporary registration of people who would not otherwise be eligible for registration. This is to enable gaps in the workforce to be filled. This may be used to enable the readmission of people who have retired or final year students. The power is to, to be exercised with close cooperation between the Department of Health and the relevant register. Clause 12 of the bill also makes provision to provide indemnities for health and social care activity and allows the Department of Health to indemnify or make arrangements to indemnify persons who are doing jobs that they are not normally covered for within the health service. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that the bill has to make provision for outcomes that we may prefer not to contemplate, but for what we must be, be, be prepared. This would include measures to ensure that the deceased are treated in a dignified way should we experience an excessive number of deaths as the result of a COVID-19 outbreak. Clause 56 and Schedule 27 of the Bill makes provision for powers of direction in relation to bodies to enable local government to direct private providers in the death management industry, for example, funeral directors, mortuaries and crematoriums, and individuals and services to implement a central plan. Part 1 of Schedule 27 creates powers to require the provision of information about capacity to deal with the transportation, storage and disposal of human remains. Part 2 provides powers to give directions which will require providers to do anything that is calculated to facilitate the transportation, storage and disposal of human remains. And this will include the provision of services, facilities, premises, vehicles and equipment. These powers are intended to improve pro the process through the system at every stage up to burial or cremation. It is also vitally important that we act responsibly in this current situation. And to that end, the Bill seeks to support and protect the public to do the right thing and follow public health advice. For example, Clause 46 and Schedule 17 makes new provisions for powers to deal with public health. It mainly enables the making of regulations by the Department of Health to allow for measures to be introduced to help delay or prevent further transmission of an infection from COVID-19, which presents or could present significant harm to human health. It also gives powers to district judges and magistrates' courts to make orders in relation to people, premises or things on application by the public health agency. These provisions are equivalent to powers that have already been exercised in England and Wales in relation to coronavirus. Clause 49 and um, Part 5 of Schedule 20 provide powers relating to potential infectious persons. These provisions give powers to public health officers, such as officers of the public health agency or anyone acting under their direction under arrangements for dealing with coronavirus. It is important to bear in mind that the powers are ex exercisable only if two safeguards are met. In the first instance, the Department of Health must make a de declaration that COVID-19 is a serious and imminent threat in Northern Ireland and the public health officer has reasonable grounds to suspect that a particular person is or may be infectious. 
If so, the public health officer can direct the person to go to a suitable place to undergo screening and assessment or quarantine. Part 5 of Schedule 20 also makes provision for additional powers for the Police Service of Northern Ireland to support actions taken by the relevant health authorities to prevent the spread of coronavirus. These will enable the police to enforce sensible public health restrictions, including returning people to isolation and, where necessary, directing individuals to seek relevant treatment or attend suitable locations for further help. Clause 50 in Part 5 of Schedule 21 to the Bill gives powers to the Executive Office to prohibit or otherwise restrict events or gatherings or to close premises. The reason that these powers are given to the Executive Office is because it is recognised that this may raise cross-cutting issues. Again, it is important to highlight that the powers are accessible in a de declaration to a health threat to public health is made by the Executive Office of Advice of the Chief Medical Officer, and the direction is given for the purpose of preventing, protecting against, or controlling the incident or tra transmission of coronavirus, or facilitating the most appropriate deployment of medical or emergency personnel resources in Northern Ireland. Mr. Speaker, Speaker Schedule 21, which Clause 50 refers to, compares powers to issue direction to prohibit or restrict events or gatherings or to close premises or places restrictions on persons entering or remaining in premises. Members, I should make it clear at the outset that these measures are not proposed lightly. The measures are proportionate to the threat we face and need to be used when necessary. Any direction to prohibit, close or restrict events or gatherings or premises can only be issued during a public health response period that we are currently in. And the Executive Office can make these on recommendation of the Chief Medical Officer or any Health Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Health. Members, I appreciate that in the face of these are significant measures that are being proposed. Some may say draconian. A few weeks ago, I would never have thought that I would be speaking in support of measures to curtail the everyday lives of everyone in Northern Ireland. Today, however, I am firmly in the position that they are necessary and proportionate. We all know that social distancing is key to ensuring that our health and social care system is not overwhelmed and that the effects of the outbreak are constrained as far as possible. We have already asked fellow citizens to drastically change their daily lives. These provisions will ensure that we can enforce social distancing when we need to. Members, the stark reality is that without effective social distancing and the measures proposed, we risk overloading our precious health system to the point of collapse and the needless death of fellow citizens. The provisions at Clause 23 to 27 on Schedule 14 confer a power to the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to require those involved in the food industry to provide information relating to a food supply chain. The information gathered will help to effectively support an industry-led response to any food supply distribution disruption resulting from COVID-19 and inform a planned response. Again, it is important to stress that these powers may only be used in the event that the food supply chain disruption or risk of disruption and the person from whom the information is required has not complied with the previous request to provide the information voluntarily. Again, they would only be activated should it become necessary to use them. It is vital that I make clear to members that the coronavirus bill will operate, it, operate on a time-limited basis and is not intended to remain in perpetuity. It will expire after a maximum of two years unless Parliament considers it necessary to extend it or reduce it. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that members are being asked to consider the legislative consent motion within a very short time frame. However, I know that members appreciate that we are operating in extraordinary circumstances and when taking the steps to have the necessary legislative provisions in place, we are not blessed with the luxury of time. In normal circumstances, I would have preferred members to have had more time to reflect on the bill. However, the fact of the matter is that these are not normal circumstances. And given the nature and speed of the events with which we are dealing, and the need to ensure that Northern Ireland provisions are included in the, in the bill, 
it has, it has been necessary to expedite the normal process. I also understand that colleagues in Scotland and Wales are working to similarly challenging timescales and trying to obtain consent from the Scottish Parliament and the National Assembly for Wales, respectively. In conclusion, I believe that it is, a, it is critical to have a consistent approach across the whole of the United Kingdom in terms of having a legislative framework which will provide sufficient powers to meet the potential challenges that we may face in having to respond to this pandemic. The coronavirus bill provides for such a consens consistent legislative approach across the United Kingdom. And furthermore, on this occasion, I also, believes, I also believe that it makes practical sense for the UK Parliament to progress legislation dealing with the transferred matters as it would not be possible to legislate for Northern Ireland separately within a similar time scale. Mr Speaker, I commend the motion and the amendment to the House. Uh, thank you, Minister. And can I now invite you to move formally your amendment? Moved. The, move, the motion and the amendment has now been moved, and I first call Palm Cameron.